Now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Luella McCarthy and the Foundation for the History of Women in Medicine. The foundation has partnered with us so far to, so far, support nine research fellows utilizing archives for women in medicine materials at the Countway Library. We share a unique collaboration in that the center is also the repository for the foundation's Alma D. Moraney Renaissance Woman in Medicine Award Oral History Collection. The foundation works with organizations to preserve the history of women in medicine and the medical sciences. And in many ways, oh, whoop, nope, wrong paper, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and promotes its impact through fellowships, scholarships, grants, and awards. We're so pleased that several representatives from the foundation are here this evening. Uh, and I now introduce Luella McCarthy, who is the 2015-2016 Foundation for the History of Women in Medicine Fellow. Luella is Associate Professor and Academic Leader of Community Engagement in the Graduate School of Medicine at the University of Wollongong, right? <laughs> is that good? Oh, <laughs> I've been practicing. New South Wales, Australia. She's held a variety of academic positions in history, but now focuses on medical education, and particularly the potential role for the humanities and sociocultural understanding in Australian medical education. Luella is co-editor for the Palgrave Macmillan Gender and History series, an editorial board member and reviews editor for MetaScience in the history and philosophy of medicine, and reviews editor for medical museums and exhibition reviews for health and history. She is past president and a national counselor for the Australian and New Zealand Society of the History of Medicine and a very lovely person. And tonight her talk will be Born International, Women, Medicine, and Modernity. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joan. Is, is, is that all coming through? <laughs> Trying not to get everyone's talks all muddled up. Um, well. Good evening. Um, I'd like to begin, sounds a bit like the Academy Awards, doesn't it, following directly after your lovely paper. I actually feel a bit um, sad coming after such a wonderful paper. Thank you very much for that. Um, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, the Foundation for the History of Medicine, uh, History of Women in Medicine and um, for this fellowship. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm honoured to be here tonight to help celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Women in Medicine Archives. I'm sorry if I get the names wrong. Um, and my hearty congratulations to everyone involved in the archives for a long and productive future. Um, so, and also thank you to um, uh, Professor Scott Podolsky for, um, for his, his kindness and uh, to Joan and everyone else who's been involved in my fellowship. It's been, it's been a tremendous experience so far. Although as I, you know, I'm only halfway through it, so. Um, so it has long been an ambition of mine to, to spend some time here um, in the archives and um, in the Centre for the History of Medicine. It you know, has an international reputation, which is not a bad kind of context for, for my talk. Um, some of you may be aware of the, the purpose of my fellowship, but working on the assumption that most of you don't, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, what it is and um, then uh, how I came to um, be involved in, in this research project. Um, so in a nutshell, the work I'm undertaking involves the history of women, medical women in medical professional societies. Um, you may or may not know that this is a very rich history. There is a lot of activity that women have undertaken in medical societies. Um, and a lot of history of women not being able to take advantage of um, participation in medical societies, which is, of course, the other side. Um, okay, so how do I change slides? <laughs> ah, thank you. Okay, so um, my fellowship extends an ongoing study on the history of women in medical professional societies, as I mentioned. Um, it's examining the role played by medical societies in women's changing place in the profession and it seeks to illuminate the barriers that women um, have experienced to medical work in the 20th century as well as the enablers. So what's, what's worked for women as well as what's um, held them back? One overarching theme in the history of uh, women in medicine is their internationalism and the interconnectedness of medical women's networks. So the objective has been to examine the place of internationalism among American medical women, particularly in the first half of the 20th century. 
And um, the point of doing that is to better understand the links between and influences of American medical women on the growing international networks of professional societies and their philosophies. So one of the major bodies that people think about when we're talking about women in um, international medical societies is the Medical Women's International Association, for obvious reasons. Um, one of the points that I'm interested in with the MWIA is the argument that it was born of war. And there's obviously very good reasons for that because it was established in 1919 at the end of WW1 um, and that as a consequence of the work that women did in World War I, they had gained a new cultural authority and independence which led them to seek new outlets for their wider ambitions. And I certainly do not want to downplay the heroic work um, of the American women's hospitals or any of the medical women who gave their professional skills, sometimes their lives, and almost always outside of official channels in order to do their bit for WW1. What I would like to uh, suggest instead <coughs> is that both of these events, um, the creation of the MWIA and the alacrity of women doctors to contribute to the war effort, were products of a deeper, older impulse within the medical women's ethos. So now I'd like to go back um, quite a bit in time and across to the other side of the world, not as far as Wollongong, but um, close to there, um, to give some background um, to this study and to the suggestion that medical women were born international. Okay, so the project that um, I'm involved in in Australia is called A Woman's Advocate, the History of the Australian Federation of Medical Women. And women began entering, I won't go into to too much detail about, um, to, about that project, but it is about looking at the, the, the growth and development of the Australian Federation of Medical Women, what its point is, and all of those issues that I raised to begin with about you know, why look at professional organisations at all. Um, and just as a bit of background, women began entering the medical profession in Australia, uh, well, medical education, I should say, this is the, the list that I have here. Women began entering medical education somewhat later than they did here in, and or in the UK, um, but earlier than some places. Um, so, you know, sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, and I also suggest that the, the wave of women's entry into medical schools around the world might be seen as one of the first global manifestations of women's place in medicine. So, you know, that internationalism was, um, was there from the outset, that it wasn't just happening in isolated pockets, it was a kind of global movement that women started to demand access to medical education. In Australia, there were no private colleges um, available that could produce um, registrable medical graduates. Only our state universities were, were permitted, basically. So only the, um, the qualifications produced by our state universities, state-funded universities, um, were, were acceptable. And at that point, we have Sydney, um, University of Sydney, University of Melbourne, and the University of Adelaide. And you can see from the pictures that, um, you know, they are august institutions. Um, we, we call them the sandstones in Australia. Um, and they, you know, take themselves very seriously. And they did too then. Um, but by the 1890s, um, there, were, there were women practitioners in just about all of the states of Australia. Not a lot of them, but they were there. Um, mm. So while universities were open to, to, uh, to women by that period, um, it had no, by no means been the end of the barriers to women's participation in medicine. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about now were um, a few women that um, I think are useful examples. The... Um, the, these are the first four women who were registered to practice in Australia. Constance Stone, Laura Fowler, Frances Dick and Margaret Corliss. Three of these four women graduated um, in medicine overseas. Constance Stone was a Philadelphia, um, the Women's College of Philadelphia. 
I hope I have the name right, which I believe is now Drexel. Um, Frances Dick was a graduate of London, so she went to the, the very famous Elizabeth Garrett Anderson School, um, but also took a degree in Dublin. Margaret Corliss uh, was a graduate of Queen's University, Ontario, um, in that tiny window of opportunity that Queen's opened for women and then closed for another 40 years inexplicably. Um, only Laura Fowler, who's the one up in the top corner, um, was a local graduate. Um, she graduated from the University of Adelaide. However, the reverse is true as well. Um, three out of the four were Australian women. So it's quite interesting to think that um, <coughs> you know, they weren't Australian educated. Constance Stone was the only ones, the only woman whose story indicated that she trained overseas because she was barred from doing so in Australia. Um, and you know, it's a it's a constant story that um, is is associated with Constance Stone. Um, however. From there, she then travelled to Toronto and then to London, and she returned in um, 1890 um, to become the first medical pra woman practitioner in Australia. Sadly, she then died in 1902, just 46 years old. Frances Dick is a, is, a, is a different case. She was the illegitimate daughter of the child of a convict. Um, in Australia, that's a kind of astonishing story. Um, but even um, overseas, I guess you can imagine that for a long time, being um, a relative of a convict was considered to be, you know, the most shameful thing that had to be hidden. And I'm sure it wasn't publicised by Frances Dick and her family. Um, um, there's lots of anecdotes that are going through my mind at the moment, but I won't, I'll spare you those. Um, what did happen, though, was her mother married... Are you OK? Are you sure? Um, that, um, <coughs> yes, and, and, I mean, it's, un, it's unusual to have a background like that anyway because for most of the early medical women, um, they were from, by necessity, from wealthy, um, well-to-do backgrounds. However, her mother married very well and subsequently had a large family who each did well in some field, science, arts and, and the business world. Frances returned to Australia in 1892 registered and practised for a while, um, and then left in 1893 um, for, for good. As far as I can tell, she never came back to Australia. Margaret Corliss, and I'm very sorry that I couldn't find a happier image for, for, for Margaret, <laughs> but there we are, um, graduated in an ex that extraordinary window, as I, as I mentioned. She then travelled to Australia with her husband, who um, was a graduate, I, from memory, from Washington, um, but she also came in 1892. So you can see 1892 is a bit of a rush year in, um, in Australia. She practised for some time in New South Wales, then travelled to Western Australia. For those of you who don't know West, uh, Australia at all, Western Australia is right on the other side of the continent, quite a distance. Um, she then came back to New South Wales and took up rural practice in country New South Wales. Um, but as you can see you know, from our not very happy photo, she did live to a, a good age. And finally, Laura Fowler. Um, Laura was the first locally educated medical graduate in Australia, but only just. Um, she was the kind of beginning of the, of, the, of the rush. However, her internationalism qualifications are nonetheless still good. Um, for following marriage to another doctor, uh, Laura and her husband, or physician, I should say, um, her, uh, Laura and her husband, Charles, left for India spending the rest of their working lives in Bengal as physicians on a variety of missions. So these four women, um, I think, highlight the various options of um, professional women association membership for women physicians as well. Um, Constance Stone, for example. Now, was I supposed to change the picture there? Constance Stone's other claim to fame involves the Queen Victoria Women's Hospital um, in Melbourne, Victoria. Um, this is again another familiar story of being able to gain hospital work meant that um, she and her then colleagues um, had to find alternatives. So the hospital they built was the first of the new Victorian Medical Women's Society's um, activities, which was formed in 1895 as the first women's medical organisation in Australia. Frances Dick, by contrast, was one of the two Australian women admitted to the Integrationist 
um, British Medical Association in 1892. Um, you're, you may be wondering why the British Medical Association is the main medical association in Australia, but we, we, we don't have time to address that question tonight. Just, I will point out that the, the BMA remained the Australian Medical Association until 1968. So the empire died a slow death in Australia. You may recall that the BMA, however, did react fairly strongly to the realisation that they'd admitted a woman uh, member in 1875 when Elizabeth Garrett Anderson became a member. In response, they quickly amended the constitution to make sure it didn't happen again. In 1892, however, following colonial representation, so, you know, the Australians can be helpful. Um, I, I'm not quite sure why. Um, New South Wales and South Australia in particular uh, made representations to um, Britain, to, to London, um, and the rule was rescinded. And Frances Dick and then after her, Laura Fowler uh, were, were admitted. I'm not quite sure if they were the first women anywhere in the world who were admitted, um, but it was very quick after the rescission motion, so um, it's quite possible. Margaret Corliss, on the other hand, as so many other women doctors, uh, physicians, especially of the earlier period, chose not to join any medical professional association at all. Um, and that remained uh, a choice for, for many women up until well after the Second World War. In fact, that didn't drop too many. The di the, if I can say dichotomy of membership, um, it's, it's often referred to as the separatist um, choice or the integrationist choice, so the women's only organisations or the joint um, organisations. Um, and it's, it's a bit misleading to say that women chose to um, join one or the other because primarily what women did was to, was to join both or neither. So that was the dichotomy often. Um, women saw many different purposes and values in the different kinds of medical societies um, and so would join both. However, let us return to the women-only organisations for the moment. In Australia, Victoria and New South Wales have a long history of rivalry over which is the best state. So the question of which states medical women were most significant in terms of the creation of the Australian Federation of Medical Women is a tricky conversation to have. Um, but suffice to say that Victoria has the longest running extant organisation of medical women in Australia, as I mentioned, 1895. It's also true that the evidence survives, uh, that survives indicate that the Victorian women were very committed to this idea. But on the other hand, New South Wales, uh, a New South Wales woman was the first president of the Australian Federation of Medical Women. You see, I have to be very even handed in these discussions. Um, it is a national project. What most concerns me here though, um, is the driving force behind the creation of the Australian Federation of Medical Women. The, the driving force was internationalism, which sounds unexpected, but was. Victoria and New South Wales both had women's medical associations of some sort during this period. However, the women of Victoria formed the ambition to join the Medical Women's International Association. Um, but they found that the body represented national, not regional organisations. So a national body would have to be formed. Um, and this was what they did. They set out, um, Australia, as I mentioned, is a big place. There are six or seven states, um, depending on your perspective. And at that time, there were two states with women's organisations. Um, over the course of a few years, they helped to establish women's organisations in every state. So they were very, very active and very committed to the idea of forming a national organisation, um, which, they, which they managed to do. Nationalism, therefore, in the shape of the AFMW, was the pathway to internationalism, um, which represented by joining the MWIA um, in 1932. So I'm sorry about all these acronyms, the world's full of acronyms. But I know that you're also interested in hearing a little bit about what I'm finding in the archive during my fellowship on this question. Um, 
and I must admit, I am still assimilating and indeed collecting material. And I fear that my proposed three week stint was wildly optimistic um, in being able to get a proper grip on the holdings. Um, and may mean I need to make a return visit. Um, so we keep that in mind. But there are a couple of speculative patterns that will inform the way the, um, the project um, on medical women's professional societies develops. One significant point concerns the vision different women had for the structure of the MWIA, the Medical Women's International Association. Here again, I get the impression of three different worldviews or three different pathways that um, women were considering on the international front. Um, although these um, differences were played down in future years or you know, memories of the, of the construction of the organisation, but that, that is often the case for those of us involved in oral histories. You know, the record of the time and the record of memory are, are often uh, complementary but different. But among the US founders, there was an expectation, I wouldn't go so far as to say a desire, but there was, there was an early expectation that membership of the MWIA would be an individual issue. It would be up to individual women to say whether or not they wanted to join. Um, they could make their own choices. On the other hand, the UK women, um, maybe further into Europe, but I'm not sure, saw the MWIA as a federation, a body providing a meeting place for existing bodies not duplicating or replacing anyone. This was an extension, I think, of what already happened in the UK where the, M the Medical Women's Federation um, had developed as a peak national bottle body um, representing its constituents. Or again, Australia seemed to be this kind of middle ground, um, possibly reflecting its colonial um, background, you know, separate colonies that only came together in federation under duress. Um, because for the Victorian Medical Women's Society, the notion that the MWIA could represent regional org organisation perhaps aligns it with the way the women in, in, in this country were thinking, um, but just slightly differently expressed. It can certainly be said though that um, had the US Australian model been adopted, the subsequent history of medical women's organisations in Australia would have been very, very different. From a clinical perspective, I've been struck by the frequency of mental health learning and teaching that women saw as or acted upon through international networks and travel. An issue I became early intrigued by was the child guidance movement, which in Australia was dominated by women physicians and which was an international network par excellence. For Lydia G. Dawes, involvement in child psychoanalytic research provides a marvellous example of a trajectory established in the late 19th century um, in international medical women's circles, continuing developing and expanding well into the 20th century. For Lydia Dawes, international travel involved working with Anna Freud in Vienna, almost up to the cataclysm of 1940. It continued through her long time relationship with Anna Freud and her work and Freud's work with um, child war refugees in the UK. The extraordinary details of these reports, if you haven't read them, I recommend having a look at them, transport you um, to, to the London Blitz. I mean, only if you want to be <laughs> transported to the London Blitz. But they're um, amazingly effective writing, which perhaps was the um, intention. Another field which I've noticed that uh, medical women, early medical women in particular, were um, dis uh, overly represented in was pathology. Um, and that is coming through in the research I'm doing now as well. And perhaps one consequence of war which illuminates the equation between medical women and internationalism was the way the war opened up the world for women who might otherwise have not had the opportunity, um, even where they um, did have the desire, to work overseas. Myrtle Canavan, who it seems is a bit of a fave in the archives, was a case in point. While widely recognised as a brilliant scientist and pathologist, it would seem these were not always sufficient to lead to a brilliant international career. Frequently, as we've heard, sometimes not even a job. Yet come war, and Myrtle Canavan, like many of her contemporaries, found herself in international demand. 
um, and I quote, Dr Purnell recommends you for lab work in France, she was telegrammed. Would you consider this together with duties of intern in Red Cross Hospital on basis of expenses paid and salary of up to $2,000? Then there are those for whom the professional side, society and internationalism are cause and effect, but not always in that order. Travel to and for professional society activity, as we have seen, was a continuing component for their own, but also for new specialist societies developing over the 20th century. Although it becomes increasingly difficult to, to actually gender um, this, is, um, this activity, because uh, men were just as likely to be involved. But another luminary um, in the Countway, Harriet L. Hardy, the International Labour Organisation, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, another organisation tracing its roots back to WW1, um, quote, and again, this is from the ILO's webpage, was moved by sentiments um, of justice and humanity as well as by the desire to secure the permanent peace of the world. It's always good to have ambition. Have a strong international focus, um, provided a strong international focus for her path-breaking work in industrial medicine. Um, as the Changing Face of Women project, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, described her, Hardy travelled widely for research and for pleasure and investigated respiratory diseases in factories and mines around the world. And then there were those, flippantly, no doubt, but with a grain of truth, early alive to the leisure possibility of conferences, as when, I hope I don't mispronounce this, but I probably will. And in fact, I'm not entirely sure of the order of the name, but I think it's Dolores Wojcik Ladislav. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that. Um, she was one of the first years um, um, intake of women in the Harvard Medical School. Um, and she pointed out that she'd been spending some time in South America using the American Pediatric Association Convention as an excuse. Anyone going to Hawaii in spring? Finally, another representative of the early alumni of the HMS, Georgiana Sykes-Boyer provided a lovely and I thought apropos example of the continuing internationalism of 20th century women physicians. As part of a reflection on the 10 year postgraduate um, experience, Boyer's research and her husband had taken her to Melbourne in Australia um, to the premier medical research establishment of the country, the Walter and Eliza Institute. And again, I'm sorry, I couldn't find for the life of me a photograph of Georgiana Sykes Boyer. So I've instead used the um, illustration from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute um, because it was also an opportunity to point out that Eliza Hall was the reason the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. But you know, as part of the um, as part of her reflection, um, she she points out that um, she's a vi virologist, virologist, um, which of course Australia would be a very good spot to work in. Um, however, all new countries ch uh, pose challenges for newcomers, as Australia did for Boyer, who, in response to the question about hobbies, pointed out that, um, you know, that there was very little free time um, because it's especially scant in Australia, which is short on labour-saving devices and has no supermarkets, which I can assure you was the case at that point. Perfectly true. OK, so just looping back now to um, the earlier points about the origins of women's medicine in Australia is that those four women were symbols as much as they were real biographical women. International travel in war and in peace, as well as the more long-term mode of immigration, played significant roles in the history of medical women, journeying from Australia, but also journeying to Australia, as we've seen, with reciprocal visits from and to the United States Europe and Asia. Along with their motor cars, travel and internationalism seem to be a symbolic feature of 20th century medical women. As I began, the MWIA, as a product of the conflagration of, of the First World War and the recent exhibition of medical women's competence and courage, needn't be seen as a starting point for their internationalist worldview, but rather was part of a new cultural norm for the modern woman. This internationalist norm was one created amidst discrimination and the attempted exclusion of women for medical women from the anatomy labs and the hospital wards. It was a conviction born of its time that medical women of the world shared more with each, with each other than they did with those 
at home who espouse nationalism while excluding and downplaying their professional and personal abilities as women. This internationalism did have blind spots and its own exclusions, and it took a pasting in the political position of second wave feminism and identity politics. But the continued existence of the Medical Women's International Association and the adoption of its model by others attests to the strength of the ideal of internationalism first promoted by late 19th century women physicians and continued by their successes in models relevant in changing times and contexts. Thank you. A question. <laughs> Did I go over time? <laughs> I'm just not a good timekeeper. Um, but if we don't have any, I'm sure Luella will also like to hang back for a moment and answer any questions you may have. Um, and now I release you. Thank you so much <laughs> for coming here to celebrate the Archives for Women in Medicine, the Foundation for the History of Women in Medicine, um, and these three wonderful speakers. Thank you.